Welcome back Travel Bugs. We're back with tips and tricks and this is our second installment. We've adjusted the format a little bit and now we've grouped them into categories. Today we're gonna to go over how to be better filmmakers. And this one will particularly focus on in-camera settings. This is gonna be five tips on how to improve your final product by using specific settings on your camera. Let's get started. First, one of the great staples of making a really good vlog or a really good film is adding awesome slow-mo footage. Now you might be thinking, hey, that's pretty easy. Let me just shoot my footage and then I'm gonna slow it down in post. Well, there's actually something you can do before you even start shooting that will make your snowmobile video look more amazing, more buttery, more smooth in post-processing. And that's shooting in 120 frames per second versus 60 or 30. Now, not all cameras will have the ability to shoot at 120 frames per second. In that case, shoot at the next highest rate. Most cameras out today will allow you to shoot in at least 60 frames per second. So the higher the frame rate, the smoother and less choppy your footage is going to look when you edit it or slow it down in post-production. Now, even a lot of the expensive cameras out today do not shoot 4K at 120p. It's okay to shoot your regular footage in 4K at 60p or 30p, and then shoot your slow-mo at 120 frames per second in 1080p. Take a look at the following footage. One of them I shot in 30 frames per second, the other in 120 frames per second. Now you'll notice one of them looks noticeably smoother than the other, and they've been slowed down the same exact amount. Let's see if you can spot which is which. So there you have it guys, how to capture much smoother slow motion footage on your camera. The next tip is to shoot in 4K. Now I know you might be thinking, well, a lot of people don't have the capabilities of streaming 4K. Not everyone has a 4K TV or a 4K monitor. And not a lot of YouTubers are uploading in 4K. Well, the reason why I say to shoot in 4K if you have the ability is that when you downgrade it to 1080p, it looks better than images shot strictly in 1080p. So what I'm saying is shoot in 4K and when you're editing, export in 1080p. So it'll still be 1080p, but you'll have a crisper image and you'll have more flexibility in editing. How so? Well, when you shoot in 4K, you're capturing a larger image. So that means if you have to zoom or crop onto that image, you're gonna have more pixels to work with than you would if you had shot in 1080p, which captures a smaller image. So shoot in 4K and give yourselves the full flexibility of editing. The only downside to this is it does take up much more room in memory. The 4K files are considerably larger than the 1080p files. But if you have the capacity, it's really worth shooting in 4K to future-proof your film. I just talked about video quality, let's get into photo quality. Especially when you're traveling, you're not just gonna be capturing video, you're also gonna be capturing photos. The best way to do that is to capture them in RAW. RAW is a very apt name for this setting because what it does is it captures the image in its RAW form with all the information available. When you're capturing image in JPEG mode, it's dropping a lot of that information to streamline the process and make the files smaller. So even though you're still coming out with a crisp, nice image when you're shooting in JPEG, when you're shooting in RAW, you have much more flexibility in editing afterwards because you have more information to deal with. For example, if you're shooting a blown out sky, you have a much higher chance of bringing that blown out sky back if you shot it in RAW than if you shot it in JPEG. If you shot it in JPEG, you can only deal with what's there. And if you shoot it in RAW, you get as much information as possible. So you'll be able to play with it a lot more and get a lot more out of your footage. Another great thing about shooting in RAW is you can always convert it to a JPEG. You can't convert a JPEG to a RAW image. So if you wanna consolidate after the fact, after you've done all your edits, after you're done with the project and you really wanna consolidate, you can always just 
turn your raw footage into JPEGs and delete your raw files. The next way to improve your filmmaking is by using picture profiles. Picture profiles make shooting and editing easier. They do this by allowing you to create set settings and then access it easily with the click of a button. A lot of cameras out today will have these already set up, so you don't have to set up custom ones. You can just go in and tweak them and then select them from the menu when you're ready to shoot. Now I'm gonna go over two specific picture profiles for you guys. The first one's gonna be a flat picture profile, which is more advanced and gives you a more cinematic look. And the other one is a more vivid, colorful, and saturated picture profile that is more for beginners to intermediate, where you have to do less in post-production, but you don't have as much range in editing as if you did shoot in a flatter profile. Take a look at this side-by-side -side footage. One of them was shot in a flat picture profile and the other in a more colorful, more saturated profile. I shot both these on my A6300, one using PP1 and the other one using PP7. PP standing for picture profile. Now I made some tweaks within that, as can you. On the flat picture profile, PP7, I used S-Log2 setting within that. And for the more colorful and vivid PP1, I used the still setting within the PP settings. As you can see, of course, one of them, this is like it's not saturated. This is why it's called flat. It's basically a canvas. So you can add your colors the way you want them. You can saturate them the way you want. While the other one looks like a finished product, it's actually not as well polished as the flat profile can wind up becoming. So this is why I say the flat profile is for the more advanced users. It's for people who can spend time in post-reduction and get that skin tone the way you want it, get the colors the way you want it, get the white balance and everything exactly that you want it. Whereas if you're shooting in the PP1, the one with the more vibrant colors, you can actually upload it as is. Just do your cuts and edits and not add any LUTs or color corrections or white balance corrections. It makes it a more streamlined, easy process and is less labor intensive. You may be wondering, which ones are we using? Well, we're using a mix of both. For our vacation, we're likely gonna be using the more colorful profile so we can streamline our editing because we're gonna be wanting to upload our vlogs every day. So we're gonna cut out a lot of time in post-processing by shooting in a more colorful profile versus the flat profile. But if we're doing something like a short film or working on something just for fun and at our leisure, we're gonna be shooting in the flat profile because we wanna master our skill at it and eventually be the profile that we use exclusively. Because like I said, it gives us the most range, the most flexibility, and we'll be able to get the most beautiful product at the end, as long as we're willing to put in the time and effort. So that's it. Let's take one more look at the comparison between the flat picture profile and the more vivid picture profile. The last tip I have for you guys today is to set your white balance. Simply put, this just means do not leave your white balance set to auto. As you move around, the lighting changes, your white balance will change and it could really mess up your shot or give you a hard time in post-process. So it's easiest to set your white balance to a constant rate so it's not constantly shifting as you're moving or shooting. Believe me, this little tweak is gonna make your editing so much easier in the long run. Now, of course, if you do something like change your lights, you wanna to wanna to change your white balance. Now your cameras will have default settings for different types of lights. However, if none of those default settings work to your liking, you can always set the Kelvin to custom. The higher the Kelvin, the warmer your white balance. The lower the Kelvin, the cooler your white balance. So before you shoot, always remember to set your white balance. Make sure it's what you want it to look like before you start editing, so you don't have to set the white balance in post-processing. Or at the very least, you'll only have to tweak it a little bit. That's all I have for you guys today. Thanks so much for watching. Look forward to more of these every Monday. Happy shooting, travel bugs.